and music. This is CHSR 97.9 FM here in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada. And you're listening to Python's Paradise, your film and music show. And this is your host, Greg Gilbert, a.k.a. the Python Hyena. And folks, I loved Animal House. That, that came out uh 1978 i would have been six years old i did not see it then (laughs) yeah my guest would have been six years old for that too (laughs) yes folks i i had back in march i had uh mr douglas c niedermeyer on here himself mark metcalf and uh now i got one of the other omegas on the phone with me um the very lovely, the beautiful, the gorgeous, the talented Martha Smith, a.k.a. Babs. How you do, Martha? I'm fine, Greg, honey. <laughs> <laughs> because that's what we call Greg in the movie. We call him Greg, honey. Or you say, he's just dreamy. <laughs> he was dreamy. He was dreamy. <laughs> <laughs> Except, according to the end credits, he gets raped in prison. <laughs> well, dreamy guys get that. <laughs> oh, well. You you know it's what an honor. First off, you know a special thanks to Steve Joyner for hooking this up. He is, uh, you know, I I had done twenty interviews in 2015. I did 48 last year, and he was my first this year. And I'm already over 60 interviews this year, most of which he's responsible for. <laughs> Oh, that's nice. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, he said he had all these contacts from Animal House. I'm like, yeah, I I know that movie. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yes, and of course, uh, that movie got was at the time the highest grossing comedy, and I used (laughs) in the grossest. Yep, (laughs) in the grossest. You know, um, but I'm gonna say though. I had kind of a John Belushi moment yesterday because I, while I was waiting for my car to get fixed, uh, uh, I went to uh, a Chinese restaurant and they had a buffet. And when I went down through that line to get food, I had a John Belushi moment. <laughs> you were going, don't know much about you. <laughs> yeah, it, my, my, my plate got piled. <laughs> yeah, with egg roll, huh? <laughs> Everything, Yes. Except I didn't have a couple of lovely ladies uh, and some frat brothers to sit down with. <laughs> there was an edited moment out of that scene where John Landis, our uh, director, actually took part in it as a stunt guy. And uh, I can't remember exactly what he did. He sort of went crashing over the uh, over the food line or something, but that didn't make it into the final cut. You know, if he can find all this footage, like you know, put it together and do an uncut version of it. I think that would no, sell. I'm sure John has all that. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. They did a great job at, with the Blues Brothers and doing an extended cut of that, and that looks terrific. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, no, I uh, loved you as Babs. Of course, uh, uh, you were, uh, I guess, one of the antagonists in the film. I always am. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, of course, the, the, you were with the lovely and the beautiful, gorgeous Mary Louise Weller, who, of course, mm-hmm. played Mandy Pepperidge. I've been in talks with her to get her on here as well. We've been trying. You know, we do uh, reunions and anniversaries sort of around the country, and we've been trying to get her as well, but she's, she's hard to reach and hard to get. She's a hard-to-get girl. But I hear she's raising horses. Yeah. Yeah. Just keep flounder away from them. <laughs> Exactly, and Niedermeyer. <laughs> yeah. Actually, you know, I've had contact with her on Facebook, and uh, I know she wants to do my show. I've been in talks with her for a couple of years now, mm-hmm. and I heard from her, I think, last month. And uh, I know she told me she's very, very busy with whatever it is she's doing, but she, I think she wants to come on, so I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, good. Yeah. And I'll get the best of both worlds because, you know, John just got her. I could have both of you lovely ladies on my show. <laughs> <laughs> and what he went through to get her, huh? <laughs> yeah, Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> She's not the only one. It's, uh, it's taken me that long either, but um, I just use patience and try to be polite about it, and hopefully it pans yeah, through. Yeah, well, if you talk to her, tell her we'd love to have her join us on some of our Animal House excursions, too. 
Yeah. No, I I um I like both of you in that movie, and uh, I just gotta ask, uh, how did you get land the part of Babs? Was it uh, um, was it just a standard audition? Well, it was a standard audition for the role of Mandy, actually, oh. uh, for Mary Louise's part. So I, I think I got the role of Mandy. I, I went for several calls, first, second, third, you know how that goes. And um, as I was reading the script, I really was more drawn to Babs because she was kind of a caricature and funnier, I thought, even though I, I'm not sure they're about similar size. Maybe Mandy had more airtime. I don't really know. But I just loved that Babs character. She was cartoony and defined in a way that, hit my sensibilities. I loved Lash and Lampoon growing up. I was a big fan of their writing, and, and Babs just was fun. So I said, can I read for Babs? And I got the part of Babs. And you knocked it out of the park. I did, and I'm not a Southern girl, but I'm always playing them for some reason. So Yeah. She, she was her own made-up accent, kind of a combination of Alabama and Mars. <laughs> yeah. Now, you were um, a Playboy play, Playmate before that. I've had a few Playboy Playmates on here who became You've had act- a few Playboy Playmates, have you, Greg? <laughs> well, I, I've, <laughs> had, I've had um, Lauren Jennifer Gates on here, and I've had Debbie Sue Voorhees on here. Mm-hmm. And okay. I didn't even know Debbie Sue was a Playboy Playmate until um, until the in- until just before I interviewed her. So I've had a few of you on here. I'm just wondering, you know, what, what was that experience like? You know, my friend just told me today that um, Amazon's got a special, something like 10, 12-part series on Hefner's Life, a documentary combined with some docudrama, I guess, which I'm dying to see because I'm so proud to have been a part of his empire, uh, as such as it is now. It's a bit dwindling, but that's to be expected. But, I mean, he broke so many grounds for so many talented writers and political movements that couldn't get a voice anywhere else in the world at the time, particularly in the 50s and 60s when it was tough, and then also in the 70s, which was my era, uh, when we were, you know, we were all protesting the Vietnam War. There was a lot of things. There was Watergate, things going on in the world, and Hefner was on the cutting edge of all that. So that's the way I look at it, almost like a political... (laughs) I know I was sitting there nude, you know, it's not really (laughs) doing much, but uh, I'm proud to be associated with that that, uh, little rabbit head. And it was, it was cool. I was real young, and we, I lived in Detroit area, a suburb of Detroit, and we shot, in that time, Chicago was the headquarters of Playboy. So I would go stay at his house there, and we'd shoot, do all the shooting pretty much in Chicago area. And when I first met him, I had been out till like 3 or 4 in the morning that night, and I had a shoot the next day, and I snuck into the house. He was playing Monopoly, and they played with real money. Okay. And he was with all his friends, you know, George Hamilton and the whole gang. Yeah. And they were all at the big table, and I was sneaking up to my room, and somebody said, this is your new playmate coming in at 3 in the morning. And he took his pipe out, he looked at me, and he said, my kind of lady. <laughs> 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 so I wasn't in trouble with the boss. Oh, that's fantastic. I've heard good things about Hugh Hefner, you know. I like him. I really respect him a lot for what he's done, you know. Um, that's that's why I have nothing bad to say about Hef. Yeah. Yeah, we hear about some of the, like I came from a Christian family, you know, and I still believe in in uh, the Bible and whatnot, but uh still I, I look at some of this other stuff, you know, and Hugh Hefner I really don't look at it from a negative standpoint. You uh, believe in the Bible and you believe in truth and the importance of bringing truth forward. He supported whistleblowers, he mm-hmm. supported people getting the truth out when it was being squelched and stymied, and that's well that's the reason I say that I, you know, have great respect for him. I like him. I, I will say I, I like yeah, him. Yeah, he's nice, and you know him. Yep. He's real nice. I'll, I'll ask you what I asked Debbie Suvorhees. Do you still have you – know, she's still got the cufflinks. Do you have any of your uh, – uh, Oh, the, like, the that's bunny? for the bunnies. I was a bunny very briefly. I hated it. I couldn't stand the shoes and the, and the thing on the waist. So it was painful. So uh, I quickly became a training bunny. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Did, the bunny is the waitress in the clubs. The playmate is the model in the magazine. They're two different things. Sometimes you're both. I was a bunny very, very briefly, and uh, then I trained bunnies. I had to learn like 200 cocktails overnight. <laughs> Did you train them. Mary Louise? <laughs> no, no, <laughs> not at all. So that's what happened there. But um, I have, I have actually something most people don't have, <laughs> and this is this is going to be an embarrassing thing to admit, but I okay. do have a nine foot <laughs> nude. 
the, on canvas of me in my living room that, here's the story, Half and the editors were looking for something called the limited edition, um, sort of really special images from all over the years. This was a few years back. And they picked 48 images of, you know, Marilyn Monroe. And I was in the 48, this really glorious picture just spread out on a quilt with some fruit and hair flying and really beautiful. Uh, looks like a painting, like a kind of pre-Raphaelite painting. And they made these huge canvases of those and were selling them for thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. And I finagled one out of the gallery for my living room. And uh, so now, like, when the pizza guy comes and sees <laughs> my husband opens the door, and he just, like, his mouth falls and goes, dude, is that your wife? <laughs> <laughs> I have a nine-foot dude. Wow. <laughs> but honestly, it's not like, you know, today's Playboy. It's actually more like something if you had had an 1835-year Playboy. It's just a beautiful painting. Fantastic. Wow. And that's what I have. But I don't have much else from that era. Well, I never heard of that before. So, yeah, I say congratulations. They they picked well when they picked you. They picked beautiful images. They're really, really nice. And now uh, we just did a show this weekend. It's called The Hollywood Show, where a bunch of actors go and sign memorabilia and whatnot. So I have the Playboy people come, you know, the collectors, and the Scarecrow and Mrs. King people, which is a whole different crowd, totally opposite, and then the um, Animal House group. And those are all different sets of, of people looking for pictures and stuff. It was nice. You mean it's not Scarecrow and Babs? No, it's not. <laughs> no. no, 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 it's Mrs. King. Well, i got to say, uh, what was it like working with Mary Louise? I thought you two were just a great pairing, you know? She's wonderful. The, the pairing was odd casting-wise because we were both the same height, the same weight, blonde hair, blue-eyed, and so a lot of people confused us. Oh, uh, I didn't. Characters. <laughs> well, my, my bouffant curled up and hers curled under, <laughs> so if you were really attentive. And uh, then, of course, she had that scene, the famous scene in the window that people also confused me for. And uh, then she had the rubber glove scene. And yeah. I have the one without the rubber gloves, and people still confuse us on that one. It's very funny because they're two cheerleaders wearing pretty much the same garb. And uh, but yeah, she's great. I loved I loved her. She's super smart, you know, really, really a brilliant, very sophisticated lady, and with uh, a lot of good wit. Did she was she nervous at all about doing that scene in the window? I don't know. I wasn't there at I, that I just wondering if you moment. might have been talking that's I all. was there for the pillow fight right afterwards <laughs> uh, Landis had asked me to take my bra off for that and I said I'm not gonna do it because I had been in Playboy and I'd been naked but uh, I was real careful about my on-camera okay because I kept Playboy quiet in those days it wasn't a good thing for your career to have been a centerfold it was a harmful thing so um, I couldn't tell anybody on my auditions and whatnot in my Hollywood acting career that was all like closet Playboy. I didn't come out for years. You know, Playboy would, would publish things from time to time. Our Martha on Taxi. Our Martha on Happy Days. You know, but uh, it, it was a little juggling. So I didn't want to take my... It's another reason I chose Babs, too. Well, you know, um, that, of course, had that famous moment where John Belushi, of course, took that ladder and climbed I out up there. And he turns to the audience he broke the fourth wall yeah and wiggles his eyebrow up and down mm -hmm. and then Bye. looks back you know and of course mandy of course mary louise is absolutely gorgeous you know but um <laughs> john that moment just lets the audience in on it you know john belushi it's you know god bless his soul it's unfortunate that he's gone but um Boy, well, I mean, I, I gotta wonder where he would be today because I mean, mm -hmm. he he had we such a him. yeah, like we need all our comedy people. This is a time in the world when comedy is actually a really important part of culture. It always has been from the court jester on, you know, and and it's it's so vital for mental health of a society to have good comic people. Particularly for me, anyways, the most important comedy is satire, which is what you know National Lampoon was. And Saturday Night Live, and and, and uh, we just we need that kind of comedy. George Carlin is gone. Robin Williams is gone. John Belushi, some of our brightest, brightest stars of comedy. Yeah, and of course, uh, John John Belushi had so many great moments in Animal House, and said 
very, very little. Like I like his first scene when when Flounder and Pinto show up and and they say, "Is this the Delta House?" And of course he turns around. And he's taking a leak and he's got a liquor in the other hand. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a great moment. So, what was John like to work with? I I know you ended up uh, getting a little splattered uh, at the table. Oh, that was fun. No, it's so funny because that's probably the question I've been asked more than anything in my life, other than what's your name, is what was John like to work with? <laughs> and um, so I finally, we used to do all these, you know, like I said, these reunions of Animal House, whoever was available to go travel and meet and greet and whatnot, sign pictures. So I got asked that so many times, I finally uh, told one of the producers, I said, please bring Judy Belushi on so that next time they ask me, I can just point and say, ask her. <laughs> so Judy started coming and joining us. And she's great. She's wonderful. But John was from my experience, pretty much what you'd expect John Belushi to be like. He was hysterically funny, really warm, fun to be around. On set, off set, he had the same, he kept up that energy, that humor. And he was the, sat- we were all the satellites around his son, you know. He was the focal point. And, um, and he was always, also very professional. He was working Saturday Night Live at the time. So he was working back in New York, flying into Oregon to, the, to our set, and then flying back to New York to shoot that and rehearse that, and back and forth, and always on time, always perfect performance. Yeah. I've actually reached out and tried to get Judy to come on here, but I have never She's heard great. back. You know, to She's do... hard to get a hold of. Uh, she's working in production as well. She's trying to get a movie going about his life as she wrote the book, you know. And um, as far as I know, she's always busy and traveling a lot. She's hard to get a hold of. Yeah. But I love Judy. If she hears this, I love you, Judy. <laughs> Write me. Yeah, but I, I'll tell you something I heard about John. I heard that he's a P.I.G. pig. He was. He was absolutely <laughs> gross. <laughs> I, also, all that food. I also heard that he's a zit get it no i don't get it no <laughs> just don't get it yeah oh i love that moment and <laughs> yeah who thought i'd be saying that for the next 40 years <laughs> that was a surprise actually you know i, I heard a story i i um that originally that uh the place where animal house was filmed uh, they were they regretted prior to that turning down that oh, shooting the graduate. the graduate they were shooting yeah. for the graduate and yeah they really regretted that one huh? yeah I just attended a, a 50th anniversary screening of the graduate and I thought oh, wow. of, yeah wow. yeah I love that movie I love Dustin Hoffman yeah Dust, Dustin Hoffman every every time I watch that movie she's trying to seduce him. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I will. But um, and then uh, of course they they were they were wise when they took in Animal House. <laughs> yeah, well, I think they were the only university that said yes. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, the mess on that front lawn, especially <laughs> with the bottom half of that uh, mannequin comes flying out. But I heard that originally. There was a lot of comedians that were cast to be in that. And, of course, they went with John Belushi. But I heard, for example, that Eric Stratton, the Otter character, was originally written for Chevy Chase. Chevy Chase, yeah. I heard that D-Day was written for Dan Aykroyd and Boone was written for Bill Murray. And that's studio thinking. You know, all, they they got to get their dollar back. And th- those were bankable stars at the time. We were all nobodies. Almost all of us, right down to the last person, was their first movie. I mean, I had done some little western like, where I got shot or something, but it was everybody was green and and new, and including Landis had done Schlock or you know a couple things, but everybody yeah, down to Ivan Reitman was so that's part of the charm of the movie. I think is the casting director I have to give a lot of credit to because he cast people at a very similar energy level, you know, and Landis energy levels through the roof, so you've got to match that with your director. And uh, it all just came together serendipitously, I think. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the Omegas there. I heard, heard getting into their fraternities awfully hard. I mean, just ask Kevin Bacon. Yeah, he's got the legacy. <laughs> he's got the sore behind to prove it. 
Yeah. Of course, Kevin was Chip Diller. Then you had, of course, Matt Metcalf, or Mark Metcalf, excuse Mark. me, as, mm-hmm. as Niedermeyer, who, 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 of course, got no more respect when he did those Twisted Sister videos. <laughs> yeah, Greggy Dougie and the Hitler Youth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. What were they like to work with? Well, there was... They did a tricky little thing that I didn't find out till afterwards. Is according to, um, they brought in the um, deltas first, and then the omegas second in terms of time bringing us up to Oregon. So the deltas all kind of bonded and got together and were having a wild and crazy time. And when we came in, we were a bit isolated and uh, to make it play on screen well, I guess was the theory. But I was like, how come nobody likes me here for the first few weeks? But then I figured out how to get into the, into the Delta group as well, because they were the fun group off camera. <laughs> but uh, they, they were all fun to work with. Mark didn't come to the parties as much, because he, he claims he was up in his room above the party room, which was D-Day's room, and uh, shining his boots <laughs> listening to us. We all, we all liked music, so everybody had you know guitars and sang, and we used to play charades and stuff and just have a good old time. Yeah, I, I love that last shot in the movie too. That I won't give away, but, but we we finally see who lands Mandy. <laughs> oh yeah, well I think most people have seen the movie. <laughs> yeah, the, the future senator. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and of course, uh, you your last scene you emerge behind that car uh, after oh, yeah. losing a few clothes and you of course uh, I, I think if you continued on you met Keith England after that scene right <laughs> yeah <laughs> and for somewhere at Universal Tours <laughs> yeah but um, going into the uh, Deltas Tim Madison of course fantastic in the movie <laughs> just don't just don't run into him while he's uh, in the food market <laughs> oh yeah uh, he, that was a great scene yeah. Um, do you have any stories about the, the uh, Deltas? we got Tim Madison, of course, Stephen First as uh, Flounder. I mean, who, who, who? Stephen shows up at a lot of our uh, events. We just, Karen Allen brought us into Massachusetts, I think it was about a year ago, uh, the Berkshire Film Festival. So we had a real nice, we have screenings, you know, and then we, we go up on stage and answer questions. And, and then Otis performed. Uh, Otis will do Shout, and Judy Belushi and I are his backup team. <laughs> well, let me tell you something. I was uh, occasionally, I, like, I know a lot of the DJs in the city, and I'll occasionally go to the nightclubs and, um, you know, hang out with friends and whatnot. One night, they played Shout by Otis, and people flocked to the dance floor. And this was played in amidst all the you know, recent stuff that's so popular today, you know? Right. And the shout song, they flocked the dance floor and they went oh, with yes. it. I couldn't believe it. I cannot hear that song. I don't care where I am. I cannot hear that song without moving. And usually I sing along really at a loud voice too. So it's just one of those very infectious songs. Yeah. And of course he had a great voice for that too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so he's still performing that when we go on the road and stuff, and uh, audiences love it. Yeah, of course, Steve, Stephen first took a lot of abuse in that movie. Oh, he's <laughs> so good. Yeah. He's so good. I love Stephen. He's such a great guy. I love that, that line from John Vernon, fat, drunk, and stupid is no way to go through life, son. <laughs> yeah, we love John, too. John Vernon again. Uh, he yeah. was so good in that movie playing uh, Dean Warmer. Perfect. Oh, yeah. what, what was it like to interact with him? Well, I didn't interact much, actually, because Babs didn't have... Uh, I mean, I knew John off from the movie, and then afterwards, of course, I was at his funeral, memorial, I mean, at the house. Um, and he's a wonderful family. It was just so very sad. But, uh, boy, he, that was great casting. What a wonderful idea to put him... He, he was really... Every time he was on the screen, boy, you were, Oh, no! <laughs> I like that line. No more fun of any kind. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and of course, um, James Widow is as Ro- uh, Robert Hoover. I loved it when they're in the in that room there, the court session, and he gets up there and he goes, "I don't think you can fully judge a fraternity without 
looking at the positive qualities of the people in it. And you're like, really? That's your opening line? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. He was good. He was great. He's a big director now on TV. Is he directing uh, toga parties? No, oh, he's directing sitcoms. <laughs> Close, close, <laughs> mm-hmm. and of course, um, of course, uh, I'm trying to think. Tom Tom Hulse, of course, went on to do Amadeus. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, went from Pinto to uh, <laughs> Wolf Creek Gang. The Wolfie Mozart. There you go. It's a long trajectory. Yes, and uh, I got to bring up to Karen Allen. Three years Love before, her. yeah, three Amazing. years she before Raiders of the fabulous. Lost Ark. She's doing movies and. She lives in this great town in Massachusetts. I just love where she lives, where, where they brought us. And um, and she's a wonderful lady. Yeah. Can you, I, I, like, like I, th- I heard that Steven Spielberg liked her in Animal House, and that was where he cast her in Raiders of the Lost Ark. Oh, it could be. That's a good story. I didn't know that. That's uh, I heard that rumor. Now, mm-hmm. whether it's true, you know, it could be hearsay, but I have read that somewhere. But now, she springs off the camera, you know, she's on the screen she just like grabs you those big eyes and all and she she looks fabulous now well you know what she had a key moment in the film for me personally because uh she is the first one to say larry Kruger's name not lonnie calls him larry oh didn't know that because when she because when um uh, larry Kruger and ken dorfman go to the delta house they keep calling him lonnie Oh, really? Because they ignore his name. Yeah, oh, that's funny. I actually missed that. (laughs) So when he's downstairs, Karen Allen goes, do you want a drink? And she clicks closer to his tag, Larry. And it's like that was the key to him being accepted. I have to look. I saw the um, final shooting draft of the script. I saw copies of that. They're autographed. And it's fun to see the differences between what ended up on the screen, too, and what's in there. Oh, Wow. Yeah, and uh, and of course um, Donald Sutherland. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he uh, he had a. And he s- didn't take points. <laughs> oh yeah, that's a that he's regretting that. Oh man. <laughs> he should have. Uh, he's doing okay, but still, that would have been a big woo. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Yeah, he was kind of surprised when this became the third highest grossing film of 1978. Yep, behind Grease and Superman. <laughs> now, there's some other people, of course, um, that I you did not work with, but I, I don't know whether you had had any interaction with them. I, I always have to bring this up, because when I interviewed uh, Cindy Morgan from Caddyshack, I had to bring uh, Sarah Holcomb up, of course, who was in Animal House as the uh, uh, mayor's uh, daughter, who ended up in the shopping cart. And, of course, I think it's kind of sad that what had uh, transpired with her. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sarah, I, even though people I didn't work with in the movie, we all were pretty tight uh, as a group uh, off camera afterwards, you know. So Sarah and I, it was holidays. We were up there in the winter, and uh, she liked to sing, and I liked to sing. And so we went, I don't know if this was very welcomed by the hotel guests, but we went up and down the halls doing Christmas carols together <laughs> outside the room. <laughs> oh, that was fun. Yeah. But, uh, no, she she had some hard times and became a recluse, and I don't know their stories. I don't like to say anything that I don't That's know. That's okay. Her. That's okay, yeah. Yeah, I just wish her well, whatever. Yeah. And, of course, the oh, was it Lisa Bearer, who played the young lady Lisa that— Bauer, yeah. Oh, Bauer. Whatever happened to her, do you know? We, she's one of those that goes in the file of lost contact with. I don't think anybody's been able to really— find her you know I, so I, we don't know I, what a dirty trick by tim madison <laughs> yeah I, I love that scene <laughs> he goes i don't think i should be alone tonight she goes i'll go get my things can you bring three dates for my friends yeah i know <laughs> that's great yeah but no i love this movie and um, i love that climax you know uh was there anything you found particularly challenging about doing this movie Probably the snow in my face in the parade scene. <laughs> oh. It started snowing while we were shooting it, so we couldn't, you know, we didn't have enough budget to really cover. You, normally you would you would just take time and reshoot and all, but we were doing just a couple takes on everything, so 
we did all the close-ups with snow falling in our face, and then uh, we did, of course, the main shots. There was no snow, and it was a difficult scene to, to break down. But it was cold. We were wearing, and those those parade days, uh, you remember the end of the movie? Oh, yeah. We, Mandy and I were wearing our little Jackie O costumes, but underneath that, we had thermal underwear, like several layers. I had long girdles. And Deborah Nadolman, the costumer, she insisted that even everything we wore, everybody underneath our clothes was authentic of the period. She's very, very accurate about this, which was really cool because we had those pointy Playtex bras that you just can't mm-hmm. find, <laughs> yeah. you know, and these old girdles and, and uh, garters and stuff like that. So we were wearing all that plus a bunch of layers of, to keep warm. It was very cold at that point in Oregon. But challenging in terms of script character, no. I mean, Landis was at the helm of everything. I trusted him totally. He was a fabulous director. Um, the script was, you couldn't improve upon that writing. Everything was in place. A couple of great moments in there. Of course, that, that parade float by the Delta, that, that tank said on the, the icing thing, said, ah, eat me or something like that. <laughs> Yes, I've signed miniature versions of that at, at autograph shows. It's funny. <laughs> and, of course, I love it when there's that crash there and this poor girl goes flying through this kid's window and he's reading oh, a playboy good. and he goes, Thank you, God! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just have this Silence of the Lambs image of that poor girl. That guy uh, reading the playboy in that scene actually went on to become a priest. <laughs> To show you how much the movie affected him. Oh, that is funny. I did not Isn't know it? that. Yeah, yeah, I heard that. I wonder if he married the girl. I don't think so. Oh. She, she, I wonder if she went into confession. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I, I love the movie. I, I do want to touch on some of your other other films, though. Um, there's one that I didn't never heard of this film, and yet I'm kind of intrigued by it. Blood Uh-oh. Link. Oh, don't be too intrigued. <laughs> oh, it's not very good? No, well, I can't say that. I mean, I had a great time doing that because they took, it was, they, it was a, um, an American cast, but we shot it in Italy, in Rome, and we had a German, uh, well, we had an Italian director and a German producer, production crew, and then an Italian crew doing, like, hair, makeup, and lighting, and all of that, so it was trilingual doing this film, and I happened to speak Italian, which is good, and uh, German, my German's very limited, so that that was a wonderful experience, and Michael Moriarty's a great actor, really good to work with him, but the, the film suffered from something, <laughs> it, was, it just didn't quite fully round out, I don't know what happened, but... Uh, well, yeah, it's on video. <laughs> well, until I was looking notes up on you to do this interview, I'd never heard of the film, and I was like, okay, it's one it of these. It has the... a couple titles. It's called Blood Link in one place. It's called The Link also. I think the name went through some changes. It's a, it's a horror, psychological horror film. So what's Michael your... Michael Marty plays a double role. Okay. What's your role in the film? I play a seductress of one of his characters. I, I actually end up getting killed in that film, come to think of it. I used to get killed a lot in uh, TV, especially. I got killed in my first six roles. <laughs> uh, yeah, every time I went out, I was, and I got killed all different, very creative ways. I got chloroformed, stabbed, shot, um, strangled. <laughs> you name it. Gee, you were lucky in Animal House. You just ended up in your bra and panties. <laughs> I know. I, at least I got to live. It was pretty exciting. You even got to be a tour guide afterwards. <laughs> exactly. So, so you got benefits there. Well, I guess you mentioned before we started talking, I guess broadcast news, which is listed in your IMDb, is no, not a not, credit. Don't believe everything you read, Greg. <laughs> well, and I was going to say, gee, what a great movie. I guess you're not yeah, part of it. <laughs> great movie. No, I am not. I did. I went right to TV pretty much after Animal House um, and did a lot of television. Okay. Um, what about Loveless in Los Angeles? Oh, okay. That was a, that was a cute little film. That was a very low budget. And um, it was a, a youth film about falling in love in a city where everybody wants to be a, a movie star. And it was well written, well done, and it just was a small film, so it didn't like splash out anything big. Okay. Yeah. Now, of course, I have to bring up a film that's 
in production this year, and you could tell me what you're able to. I mean, this interview is not going to come out for a while, probably towards the end of the year. Mm. So you're probably safe, but again, I, I respect whatever you're not allowed to reveal. But a fertile and stupid gesture, of course, about uh, a guy I have not brought up yet, Doug Kenny, of course, who played Stork in Animal House. And more importantly, was one of the key writers of the movie Animal House. Yep. Doug Kenny was uh, with Maddie Simmons and everybody over at National Lampoon, from which was originally Harvard Lampoon when he mm-hmm. was there also. So he was one of the chief creative minds from that wonderful, wonderful publication. And from that, they did a yearbook, uh, a mock yearbook that made fun of just sort of your average town high school yearbook. And they took a lot of the characters from Animal House from that yearbook that was from Harvard and National Lampoon, and that became National Lampoon's Animal House. So Doug, uh, yeah, it's called The Feudal and Stupid Gesture, the movie, and it's for Netflix. It's a Netflix film. We don't know when it's coming out. It'll be sometime this year, but I know they just had to shoot some extra scenes a couple weeks ago, I saw. Um, and I, if I, uh, I can't really say what I play in there because it would tip off. I have a cameo comedy part. And it was really fun to do, really, really Oh, fun. I know but you play in it. <laughs> yes, I do, but I just don't want to say because it would ruin it, the fun of, of discovering what I play. But uh, Doug was, oh, I just have wonderful, warm memories of Doug and um, always like to be involved in anything that's going to be a tribute to him. And this is like his story, you know, of his life and through all of those incarnations of his work and his writing. So I was really glad somebody was taking it on and really, really happy to be part of it. I wish they'd release in the theaters. I would like, I'd go see that. I don't know if it, I, you know, it's a Netflix thing, so, but it was a very big budget for Netflix. I was surprised. I think it's a $30 million budget for a, a Netflix movie, so. Well, I was looking through the credits, like, I, I'm wondering, Good you know, can, like, can Joel McHale really pull off Chevy Chase? Oh, well, we'll see. Like, you know, <laughs> I'm kind of like, uh, they don't look alike. <laughs> Well, it's about it's about the te- you know recreating a character is is about the energy more than the look. Well, I think Joel's a talent, but you know it's just I I don't know maybe he'll pull the you know it's funny because Doug Kenny you know I always felt sad that he was not happy with uh, Caddyshack and uh, I understand yeah, no. why He's very particular yeah. But uh, I, I kind of wish he got to see what Caddyshack had become. I you know. know a lot of people wish that. You know, but but. Um, I, I guess I guess it went from the caddies to the comics, but uh, but again, you know, um, I don't know what Caddyshack would be without those comics. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, Doug was just a, an, an amazing mind. That I don't think I've met anything parallel to that in terms of what his brain power was and and his grasping of of so many things as well as satire. So it, that was a big loss. That was a really big loss at a young age, too. And I wish he'd seen what happened to Caddyshack. But, you know, some people just aren't ever fully satisfied with their own work and always want more. Well, Better. speaking of brain power, of course, he played Stork. And you know what they said? They said everybody thought Stork was brain dead. Yeah, I know. Yeah, well, he was acting. <laughs> he had that one line in Animal House where he says to John Belushi, Moron. <laughs> calls him a moron. <laughs> it's a great scene, too. Yeah. No, it's unfortunately he's gone. I think it was a skiing accident, if I remember correctly. No. No? No, he was in Hawaii, uh, and he walked off a cliff. And uh, to this day, it's a mystery. Oh, I always heard it was a ski. Where did I hear no. that? No, 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 not skiing. It was Hawaii, and you know those very steep cliffs there over the ocean. And um, we don't know if he took his own life or just had some bad footing or what. We don't really know. Was Chevy Chase with him at the time? I believe he was. No, no, nobody was with him at the time, or we would know. <laughs> well, I know that Chevy Chase has always was, been as, been associated within the scene. That's that's why. So I'm wondering with, whether I've been reading uh, false stuff or. He was in the in Hawaii, I believe, at his house. But this was not at his house. This was out in the middle of those wonderful, beautiful cliffs over the ocean. Wow. Well, that's that's unfortunately he's gone. He was one of the founders of National Lampoons. Yeah. So yeah, a great creative mind. Well, I hope this uh, Netflix uh, 
movie does well. We've, I do we, too. I hope it does. <clears throat> I, I hope. I think. It, I think it's got a really good cast, and it was a g- nice script. So I, I hope it does well. Yeah, we've lost way too many comedians in the last short while. You know. Yeah, I know. I mean, we've lost Rodney Dangerfield. We've lost. Uh, we lost Robin Don Williams. Rickles. We just lost Don Rickles. Don Rickles. Actually, it's interesting because when Robin Williams passed away, um, something came up that was to. Uh, help raise awareness for suicide and depression. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because uh, a couple of years ago they had, the, of course, the Ice Bucket Challenge right. for ALS. Mm-hmm. They did another one for Robin Williams where that involved, uh, for suicide and depression awareness, it involved taking a pie in the face for suicide and depression awareness. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah they should probably do one for it getting off of psychotropic drugs that don't help depression actually give suicidal thoughts to people when they are depressed that would be really useful i never heard of that oh yeah there's plenty of documented evidence on that and uh i mean it's right on the inserts in the packages it causes suicidal ideal ideation it's called i believe if you want to use the technical term but those drugs that people are prescribed like candy for every time they feel like, oh, I'm sad, here, have a drug. Those drugs are addictive and very dangerous, and they're prescribed way too easily to too many people. And suicide is very high all across the board, not just, not just the occasional suicide right now. We've got it in our veterans, we've got it in our kids, young and old, and it's just rampant. Oh, yeah, that's unfortunate. Yeah, so... Uh no, I was helping get that uh, little campaign awareness thing on the go and hoping we can get it to go viral. I've had a few people take uh, take me up on that, which was which was fun. Mm-hmm. But uh, anyway, um, um, I won't keep you too much longer here, but I, w- I would like to say, here we are. That film came out in 1978. As of next year, that film is going to be 40 years old. Yes, like you. I was six years old when we shot that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Playing a college student. Pretty good acting, huh? <laughs> there you go. You're, you're pulling off a Doogie Hauser. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's for, we should do something for the 40th. Universal should do something for the 40th. They did in uh, 2003. That was our, what, 25th, I think? They did a huge event. They, they closed down Hollywood uh, Boulevard and reenacted the parade with those of us that were around, you know, and it, it was it was an all-day event with tons of press. It was really fun. How did you, you do something for the 40th? How did you reenact it without Belushi? I mean, Belushi does grab they poor man. They had a guy kind of playing that role, and they had him with his, you know, sword and everything in that last costume. And uh, and we had Otis do shout. We danced. It was fun. I love that when he comes down off that roof there. He sees uh, Mary Louise Weller, and he grabs hold of her, picks her up, opens that car door, grabs one of the deltas, and just heaves them out of the car, puts her in. me in my bra. (laughs) And then the the, the car moves, and there you are. Uh, Even bloody murder. (laughs) Oh, that that was so, so good. That was so fantastic. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, but John doing that with Mary, that was like Beauty and the Beast right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, Mary, or Mary. Martha. <laughs> Martha. Getting you confused with the other blonde in the film. See, I told you. <laughs> uh, I, I, I was going to say, you know, um, be, uh, one thing I wanted to ask, I, 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 I've got to bring this up. I I would love, I'd be so honored if there's if I could get an autographed picture is there a way I could do that? Yeah, sure. You can just send off to that email address we were talking about earlier. You can send off your info, and I will send you. You want an Animal House picture, I presume? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Although, although I gotta say, I, I've seen a, a recent picture of you with uh, Steve and, and Keith. I gotta say, you still look stunning. Steve and Keith, really? Oh, you saw that? I saw oh, that. thank you so much, by the way. It's funny, I was at the Hollywood show this weekend, and, and there's, you know, everybody takes about 3,000 pictures, so each time somebody would come up and want to take a picture with me, I said, I have one stipulation, put your flash on your phone, because anybody over 35 needs a flash for Phil. So I got a bunch of really good pictures with flashes. 
Check your image. <laughs> oh yeah, no, he. Uh, there's a picture of you and Steve Joyner and uh, uh, Keith England, and uh, okay, yeah, and I, I thought, wow, she still looks stunning. Oh, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll send that, uh, that, uh, that off to that email address, and uh, I'll, uh, yeah, look forward to getting that. I would, I would love that. I would appreciate that very much. Cool. Now, uh, before I let you go, would you please do a plug for my show? Sure. Yeah. Just state your name and, and who you played in Animal state House. Your name. <laughs> yeah. This is like being an Omega all of a sudden. Oh, yeah. <laughs> What's that on your chest? <laughs> a pledge <laughs> pen on your uniform. <laughs> you say and your then name. What else did you want? Um, my name, of course, is Greg Gilbert. My show is called Python's Paradise, Python like the snake, mm-hmm. and I'm from New Brunswick, Canada. So you, what do you want me to say there? Just, just say, that, say your name, who you played in Animal House. Say you're listening to Greg Gilbert on Python's Paradise okay. in New Brunswick, Canada. Have you ever been in New Brunswick before? You know, I, I might have. I did a lot of uh, Canadian touring when I was with Playboy, actually. Oh. Matter of fact, I remember going to a very weird place called Sudbury. <laughs> oh, okay. We have that here, yep. Yes, and the mayor gave me a key to Sudbury and some nickels. <laughs> I'd like to give you a key to Fredericton. Okay. Fredericton, New I Brunswick. Like give you a key. Right, so yeah. You're listening to Okay, I got it. You got it? Uh-huh. Do you want me to do it in Bab's voice? If you want to, that would be great. <laughs> All right, I'll do that, and you just tell me when to go. Go now. Hi, everybody. This is Martha Smith, otherwise known as Babs, honey, from Animal House, and you are listening to Greg Gilbert of Python's Paradise in New Brunswick, Canada. That's <laughs> like north up there. Yes. Keith doesn't ever punch your teddy bear like Greg did, right? Oh, I would kill him. <laughs> <laughs> Martha Smith, thank you so much for coming on this show. I, I, this this okay. means a lot to me that you come on here. Good. I hope it all puts together well and uh, send that link up. And I will. I have. I don't do Facebook, but my, I have a somebody put up a fan page for me that she she posts everything people like to listen to. Okay. Well, just be patient about it because I know it's yeah. going to be a few months down the road. You're number 134, and the one that airs this weekend is going to be number 75. <laughs> no problem. So I've got a lot in front of you, but uh, it, it is going to air. And I got two hour shows Sunday night, so sometimes I can get two interviews on there. So there you go. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Well, thank you very much, and God bless. Thank you, too. God bless you. Thank Thank, you, Greg. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye.